Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Anthony Gonzalez and I'm the program coordinator for the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery. And I'm joined with my colleague, Logan Davis, and we're very excited to welcome you to our session titled, Introducing the Guide to the Eight Professional Competencies, Competencies for Higher Education and Substance Misuse Prevention, Overview, Content, and Applications, presented by Dr. David Anderson and Joan Masters. Before we get started with today's content, I do just have a couple of housekeeping slides I'd like to share with everybody. We are in the Zoom webinar format, so it should look somewhat familiar on the screen. We do welcome your questions at any time for our panelists, our presenters, and please utilize the Q&A feature. We do have the chat enabled today, but please use that to introduce yourself and share reflections and resources, but try to put your specific questions in the Q&A box. We do have live captioning available for today's session, and you can turn that on through your bottom dashboard. If you have any issues setting that up, please feel free to send me a chat and I will help you through that process. We encourage everybody to learn more about becoming a member of the Higher Education Center. You can learn more about the different membership tiers and the benefits that go along with them by visiting our website at hucaod.osu.edu. We also have an, a few upcoming events that we would like to remind every about, everybody about. We have our Cannabis Symposium happening on December 1st and that you can visit our website to get a, a look at the full agenda as well as a, a link to the registration. We also have a water cooler chat titled Reflection, Re Reflecting on 2022 happening on December 13th and is moderated by Dr. CJ from uh, East Carolina University. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today our two presenters. Joining us today is Dr. David Anderson, Professor Emeritus from George Mason University, and Joan Masters, Senior Project Director with Missouri Partners in Prevention. It is always uh, a pleasure, and I'm always grateful for the opportunity to learn from both of you. So it's my pleasure turning it over to you at this time. Thank you, Anthony. Glad to be here. and and. Well, my title says Professor Emeritus from George Mason University. That's true. Uh, I live in Florida and I relocated here seven years ago, but I began my career at The Ohio State University. I began my career, my professional career and my work with alcohol and drug issues. We're going to hear a little bit about you and your experience uh, and years with uh, drug and alcohol abuse prevention. Um, Joan Masters uh, in from Missouri, actually not in Florida from Missouri, but in Missouri as we speak. Uh, so Joan, a little bit about yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Joan Masters. I'm the project coordinator for Missouri Partners of Prevention, which is a coalition of 24 colleges and universities in the state. Um, and so my role transitioning from working in drug and alcohol abuse prevention as a young professional always has been supporting and helping other drug and alcohol misuse professionals do their work, especially in higher education. So I'm extremely passionate about the work that um, David has been doing and some related work that I have also been doing. So I'm really excited to share with you today what we've been up to. Yeah, and we were so excited to share this, this uh, resource. Uh, it was actually a couple of years in the making and uh, Joan and I, you'll hear about Joan's involvement with that and some other initiatives. Uh, but excited, excited about sharing this with the field. What I didn't mention when I started at Ohio State in drug and alcohol prevention work was that was 1975 when I started in the prevention work. And so many of you may know that I do the College Alcohol Survey and then Dr. Tom Hall and I did a book about a year and a half ago published by NASPA. But let's, let's jump into this resource. We're gonna have opportunities for dialogue in about 35 minutes, uh, 40 minutes, and uh, some hopefully some rich discussion. So um, Anthony is going to go back to the screen and then I'm going to manage that, uh, assuming that this will work well. Here we go. And so, you know, this is all about this guide, this new guide. You're going to learn more about that. We have the contact information here and as well as at the end, and our affiliation. This is the guide. It's 72 pages. It's free. It's downloadable. It was sponsored by the Mid-America Prevention Technology Transfer Center. And it's really about working with the professionals on the campus 
could also be paraprofessionals, but enhancing the skills. We know that many of you have been doing this for years. Some of you are more relative, more new to this, and this is for all of us, and you'll, you'll learn more about all of that. Uh, there's a QR code. You don't have to rush to scan it. It's, uh, it's going to be, it's also in a handout, a two-page handout that summarizes this, that you can download and print out. You can also download this, this piece. Again, it's available at no cost. You can do the short URL or the long one. It takes you to the same place. Our objectives that have been published are to understand some of the context, some of the rationale. We're not going to jump right into the, the resource, but we're going to learn a little bit about the rationale of this, just a little bit of grounding. Some of this you may choose to use as you are advocating this same shared mission with decision makers on your campus, in the community, in your state, and even the nation. We're going to learn about the eight core competency areas. We'll understand why we say the eight, some opportunities for various people on and off campus, and then some training that's available uh, that we are uh, that we'll, we'll talk more about. So this is our outline for the next, if you will, 40 minutes. You see that we want to end with your discussion and your perspectives. So again, welcome and a quick question for you. Real quick, if you would put into the chat the answer to this question and put your answer in years. How long have you worked with drug and alcohol misuse prevention? If you really haven't done that, just put zero. Zero is okay. Uh, we welcome partners. We welcome collaborators. So if you haven't worked, and this can be, you know, it, it, we're, we're thinking of in a dedicated way. You know, I mentioned that I started prevention work in 1975. I had been working in residence halls for four years at that time. So obviously I was working with it because so many incidents came across my desk and, and in the experience in the residence halls at Ohio State. So Logan, I know, is taking a look at this. What some, fasc some fascinating results, Dr. Anderson. We're seeing actually um, two kind of pillars pop up. We see a uh, but, uh, like a second majority of 20 or more. Oh my. So a large of 20 or more. And then we don't really see, we see one like 15. We don't see a whole lot between 15 and 20. And then everything else is 10 years or below. We don't see any anything between 10 and 15. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, there's a, only a few, but it's either under majority is under 10 or over 15. That is fascinating. Fascinating. Any zeros? <laughs> yes. Yeah. A good number uh, of zeros. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Well. That's good. That, that, that's good to know. That's good to know. Very help. That's very helpful. And I applaud those of the, those of us who've done this for 20 years or more. We're staying with it, and uh, we keep looking for new tools. This one we think will be very, very helpful for helping make your job easier. I know that sounds like a dream, but easier. Let's just look at a little background. Substance. We we all know this. Substance misuse. Issues continue, the environments and quality of life are negatively affected, academic success is hampered. I mentioned I do the college alcohol survey. I've been doing that since 1979 when I started it with Angelo Gattoletto at, at when we were both at Radford University. And, and this is the most recent data. The next survey will go out in 2024. So that's February 2024. So we're starting to think about that. So alcohol's involvement. I mean, this is this is a third to 40 percent of the behaviors we all know this we know this how about personal behaviors up to a half on some of these things can you imagine what our campus would be like if we didn't have alcohol's involvement and this is not capturing marijuana this is not capturing opiates this is not capturing other drugs it's just alcohol and then alcohol's involvement with academic issues so again alcohol's very, very much involved. And so that's part of the grounding. If you need more of that, it's it's on my, George Mason still has my, my website. So we also know, again, from the same survey that our prevention specialists, many of you here are dedicated and you have multiple responsibilities. And, and in, during the pandemic, you got some other responsibilities for which none of us were trained. You know, whether it's, you know, some of, some of the enforcement or monitoring or testing and so forth. Um, we believe that there's a greater, under, greater understanding of broadened and deepened skills. And that's not just by the prevention specialists, that's by for those around them. 
often you feel unsupported. You feel like your boss doesn't get it. Uh, your boss wants you to do three things. You know you need to do 20, and those may not overlap. We know that. So we think we need to help educate others outside of the prevention folks of what is needed to do a meaningful, effective job with the prevention work, the important work that we're doing. Uh, preparation for a prevention specialist is limited. Uh, I'll document that in a moment. And then uh, looking for greater efficiencies. And again, when we asked in the College Health Call survey, how does the professional, the, the, if you will, the coordinator or the specialist, how does their time align itself? You know, you see just over a third on education. Uh, you know, 13% on counseling, a little bit more on administrative and so forth. That's a lot of different skill sets. That's a, that's a big challenge. So, so here's two different studies. These next slides are two different studies that I was involved with. This one was with Mark Kredovics, who's up at uh, Kent State University. And so the question is, we looked at all the graduate programs in higher ed administration, student affairs, whatever they may be called at the master's level, and we contacted the coordinators. We did some other methodologies, but this was from a quantitative assessment. We said, how much does your program address it? How much does it, and a five is very much. Look, look at where the, the top one is stress management. And we're talking about preparing the professional for their work with students and on the campuses to follow. So that's the big one, but look at where the substance related items were below a 2.5 for all of us, between a two and a 2.5. So in a separate study, I did this with two colleagues of George Mason, Todd Rose and Alex Williams. Uh, we said, and, and we were asking new professionals, where'd you get your preparation? Where was it? So if you look at the graduate program, we, we had a bunch of different issues, like psychological, interpersonal, each of those uh, had specific topics within those. So on the substance abuse, this is the professional saying, here's what my graduate program did. It was it was low. It was one of the lowest uh, next to right next to physical prep, uh, you know, the physical, the, the physical aspects of student life and then self taught. So the, the three on a five point scale and that's consistent with what we saw from the program coordinators on the graduate programs. Again, on this same assessment with these professionals saying, how well prepared do you feel? Again, a five point scale, uh, top one being alcohol, 2.65 on a five point scale. So it's all consistent. The preparation just isn't there, at least from the academic side. So that's a big opportunity. So now let's turn, if you will, to the development process. And it all began about a year and a half ago, I got a phone call from Dave Clausen, who was director then of the Mid-America PTTC, and said, what can we do to help better prepare the professionals and bring to light a lot of the responsibilities? What might that look like? How do we build, how do we demonstrate what the competencies are? And it was a blank slate. So I went to probably 20 different resources from the CAS standards to NASPA and ACPA uh, to ACHA, various sources. I looked at SAMHSA, I looked at NIAAA, NIDA, DEA, all sorts of resources. We see resources about how do you do a program, but how how is it how do we have the resources? What are the resources for the professional development? And I created a, a mammoth, if you will, a mammoth um, document. Um, so this is what the background was. I ended up with 12 core areas. I did this in nine months with 864 competencies. And you're going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, 864. That's a lot of skill sets. Well, in my view, and this was one person doing it, in my view, those were the competencies that were needed. I organized those into, if you will, foundational, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, so each competency had a place and, again, lots of, lots of, if you will, grounding in other sets. Uh, these are the 12 areas. If you, if you organize them into four, you know, from core, core knowledge and core functions to planning, implementation, and then personnel. That's how I organized it. And then out of that, within that, you'll, you'll see like here are six of them, and then here are the subtopics within those. So drug effects, and then I itemized specific elements that I thought were important. So I did that for all of these. That's where I ended up with 864. This is 
the framework of these 12 areas. So we're not going to belabor that because we move beyond that. So as you look at one of the areas, for example, um, the, if you will, the content area or the strategic planning area, you'll see all those specifics in there. And so that became a finalized document and that project ended. And at the same time, Joan Masters was doing a project that she's going to say a, just a, a little bit about, and then we're going to go into then what happened. Sure. So in a perfect world, um, David and I have talked about this many times, he would have completed this entire project and then the answer or the question would have been, how do then we train people in at least the foundational competencies, if not all of these competencies. However, this isn't a perfect world and we all have lots of conversations with different colleagues when we're talking about what we're excited about or what we have energy about. And at the same time, I was working with Dave Clausen, also in Mid-America Prevention Technology Transfer Center, um, on some just foundational, what would a foundational training look like to address some of the things that myself as a professional and as a training professional thought that those entering the field or new to the field, even though they aren't entering um, uh, maybe student affairs work or work in health promotion might need to know about. And that led to the development of a six module training series, which uh, the Prevention Technology Transfer Center Great Lakes um, allowed me to develop and pilot test with members of, um, of the higher education community about six or seven months ago. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about the next steps with that training later in, but we want to let you know that in addition to developing these competencies and working with a set of folks to um, give you the document that you will see today, there is also foundational training that was being developed at the same time. Yeah, and, and it, what, to me what's interesting is that these two independent PTTCs were interested in the college audience from different perspectives, which was which was great. So 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 then I got a phone call from Dave. Thank you for, I don't know what it was, a 70, 80 page document with those 864 competencies and the resources and so forth. So he said, thank you very much for that. Now, can we think about how we get it implemented? And I said, I need help. I mean, I, I need an advisory group. I identified an advisory group, uh, a, a planning body. Joan was obviously one of those. And here are the other four. Many names that you're familiar with have having been around um, alcohol and other drug issues, prevention issues for, for decades. And so I, I looked at different skill sets, different regions of the country, different backgrounds. Tom Hall actually was uh, at University of Central Florida at the time we, had, we tapped him and then took a different job at, in Orlando, uh, Florida. And so that's what we did. And so Joan's going to talk a little bit about what that was like, what the you know, where they started was they got the 864 competencies in those 12 areas and they took a deep breath and said in January, just 10 months ago, that's when we first met. And that was phase, that's the beginning of phase two. So it was some of the things um, that we looked at and originally were to really think about what the, like clarifying what this process was like. Nothing like this had ever been done where we really took a look at prevention specifically for higher education. As many of you, I know that I, I recognize some names in our participant list. You're in the community. You might be familiar with SAPS training or the IC and RC standards, but those are all for prevention and not necessarily a different type of prevention um, that we do at the higher education level. And so um, we really needed to think about what was both specific and appropriate for substance misuse prevention, but also specific and appropriate for those working in higher education. There are some things that are just inherently unique. Um, we are not in K-12 prevention where everyone is under 21. We are not um, working in a setting where politics is not an ever-present um, piece of the work that we do. And so what specific skills are necessary um, in coalition building and other things that might be just look a little bit different in higher education. 
So as we looked at the phase one documents that David provided to us, it was really important for us to think about refining the competency areas into things that were manageable, that made sense to our community, that were maybe um, uh, we've heard of in other ways as we've worked with, say, the uh, Institute of Medicine strategic planning model or the strategic prevention framework, and really think about um, addressing the, the need for aspirational competencies that we don't know if there will ever be, and hopefully there will be, um, and maybe it's probably long after David and I are done doing this work, but there will be a prevention professional that, that has all of these competencies but rather that they be aspirational in nature, that when someone is hiring a preventionist on a, in a higher education setting, that they are hiring keeping these job duties or competencies in mind. When we are training professionals in higher ed programs, that we are keeping these competencies in mind. When we're doing training um, in our statewide coalitions like my own or on behalf of NASPA or creating publications for our state agencies, that we're thinking about what our folks in higher education need to have and then identifying resources as well as um, thing, like specific knowledge and skills for each application that um, of a competency that we're seeing that folks need to know. We have a lot of opportunities within higher education substance abuse prevention to learn. There's a webinar almost every day. There's great conferences. We have resources. But how are we taking what we learn and specifically putting that into action? And so a lot of our conversations really then centered with David around um, organizing it in such a way that allowed us to see um, to see how each of the competencies flowed from conceptual to an action or a skill that we can practice and measure um, as a prevention professional. And so you'll see when you download the guide um, that there are um, a number of, of these categories or that, that our competencies fall into, um, from communication and advocacy to leadership, to needs assessment, evaluation and research, strategic planning, knowing just the, the ins and outs of the information of the substances that students are misusing and using on our campuses. Um, and it was important for us for then um, folks to be aware of what these were and what the specific competencies were under each of these categories. So you'll see um, that, um, again, the intent of this is meant to be aspirational and big picture so that those who are working in substance use prevention, again, however this is used. I know in my own coalition work, I've started to think about what training I'm providing, what um, maybe going to these competencies, we're definitely going to these competencies and stating for my folks what competencies this would provide them knowledge and skill practice for. Um, that way people are understanding that the work that we do is, is inherently professional. I think people tend to think of us sometimes as programmers or as people that just, um, you know, this is added to their job. But this is a health promotion profession. We wanna legitimize that professionalism and creating this um, kind of aspirational big picture for success is a really key component to that. So you'll see in each competency that there'll be a number of, of competencies that we have um, stated for application. So there's about 70 competencies, um, 101 competencies under um, the knowledge that needs to be um, that needs to be gained in order to be proficient in that particular, um, or I, I guess I won't say proficient, but to to have um, awareness of what that competency means, as well as skills or practice, if you will. Um, so I think this be goes beyond some of the training that we do, but rather the on-the-job preparation that our bosses and supervisors, et cetera, might give to young pre prevention professionals or new prevention professionals as we're doing this work. So I must say, working with Joan and the other four advisors and then the executive director who took Dave Clausen's place at the uh, Mid-America PTTC, it was it was quite a journey. One of the things I said at the very beginning last January is, you know, we're going to we're going to work hard, but we're going to have fun, too. 
we never recorded any of our sessions, but some of them were so rich in discussion about how do we move this forward. So the next two segments in this webinar is a brief look at the contents. Each of you can download this and we're not going to do it live, but we're going to show you what's inside and how to use it. So we're going to talk about a little bit on the contents. Joan has just done that overview of the eight areas, uh, focusing on that health enhancing environment, and then how to use the guide. So again, when you, you see that same model, and then right below are, if you will, hot links in the PDF file. So if you look at prevention science, you click on that and you go to the prevention science pages for the competencies. So you see that for each of the eight. And so here's an example with strategic planning. So you see right here is the first four on these pages of the guide. You see what Joan outlined a moment ago with the application, that first one where it says the application and then the skills and knowledge that feed into that. There's always at least one knowledge item and one skill item. Of course, there's cross fertilization with these, uh, but we tried to keep as focused as we could. And what you see in the upper left, and this is true for each of the eight pages, each of the eight introductory pages for the eight areas, you see a hot link there for resources that'll take you to the resources specific for strategic planning. And then separately, if you want to go back to home, which is like page 25 of the booklet or so, uh, you go back right back to that home button, uh, which is the eight competencies. So again, this is the strategic planning pages. And then we have the resources. This is the first page of their resources. And for each of those eight core areas, we've highlighted three or four key resources and then other resources that have to do with strategic planning alphabetical order, URLs as appropriate. And all of these resources and all of this thinking, and again, I emphasized at the beginning the word the, the eight. It, it's our view, the six of us, it's our view that these are the eight core competencies today. These, is, these are our best take on the competencies themselves. So the eight clusters, the eight core areas, the elements within there, and then the resources. These are current for our thinking as of October 2022. So something new is going to come along. This could be updated. Uh, there may be some evolution in the field to condense something or add something. But we wanted to highlight these are the eight today. Then we also have, separate from those eight areas, we have four other kinds of resources that we thought would be helpful. And these are, for example, with CDC, this is an alphabetical order. So within CDC, those are the elements that we found to be most helpful with DEA and so forth. Uh, so there's a couple of pages of federal agencies. We also have something with national organizations and resources. Uh, so not all highlighted here. This is just illustrative. We have news and information resources and listservs. For example, we contacted, we're contacting each of them, part of our implementation plan with a press announcement that says, hey, this resources is out there, it's free, it's downloadable, we hope you can use it. We say a little bit more than that in our press announcement. And then data sources. What are helpful data sources from our perspective? So all of that is within this guide. Now briefly, how to use it. So that's the content. Now, the beginning also has a how to use. So the first 20 pages is a how to use, which is organized this way. So some of the, if you will, some of the why in there, we have already in this, in this webinar. We've highlighted some of that. Uh, there's much more there. And of course, you can add more for yourself uh, in terms of why something like this is important. The, the how, you've heard a little bit about that, uh, how it's organized, and then uh, we're going to talk more about the audiences for use. So looking at the why just very briefly, and then I'll turn it back over to Joan when we talk about, talk about the audiences for use. You know, understanding the effectiveness of service delivery within the framework of comprehensive. Comprehensive campus effort is vital. It's not where we were 40 years ago when we made sure we had a policy and uh, maybe an awareness day or week or month. Maybe a counselor who would help. 
it's much more complicated than that. And, and, and to be more comprehensive is vital. Uh, as, as some of you have heard in other webinars and trainings I've done and will be doing uh, upcoming conferences, uh, you know, we see tremendous growth with recovery services on our, on our campus. So we have a long ways to go, but we've had a lot of growth, even in the last 10 years. Uh, problems continue, and, and, and most of these are preventable. And then it's important to allocate personnel and other resources and to elevate the, the important role that you are doing. And again, you have this, this quote from the, from the resource. So then we have the campus context. Again, having comprehensive program, research has uh, provided a lot of evidence of, about important initiatives that, that have been undertaken. Many planning tools exist, uh, whether it's the strategic prevention framework, and, and that's been around for a couple of decades, uh, prevention with purpose, and then the planning model that Tom Hall and I did in our book, uh, again, published by NASPA a year and a half ago. So a, a couple other pieces on the campus context uh, that, that you, you've, you've heard. And again, that next to the last one about a lot of efforts just in the most recent survey, and I don't think this is COVID related, a lot of efforts are declining and policies are getting a little more lax. So it's time to reinvigorate. And, and that's uh, part of what all of this is. So Joan's going to highlight some of the audiences for use, and then we're going to move in, and then some training opportunities, and then move into our discussion. Thanks, Devin. I think that um, when our when our planning group was thinking about um, this resource a lot, we we often got went back to who is going to read this, what would be most helpful, and not just read or keep on a shelf, but truly use and interact with. And so I think we saw a lot of applications. One for our own selves as prevention specialists. I know that I work with folks that are um, hired as the drug and alcohol abuse coordinator or misuse coordinator or to their job and they ask, where am I supposed to start? What should I be good at? What training should I focus on? And if that individual is lucky enough to be part of a statewide coalition or have a really fantastic energized supervisor or mentor in the field, that question's answered pretty easily. But unfortunately, that doesn't always exist. Or still, those resources need to have a resource to point to about the competencies of this particular work. And so individual professions, prevention specialists can use this, whether you're three months into the field or 30 years into the field. Um, I think it's important for us to think about our campus leadership and when we hire and write job descriptions and think about, again, professionalizing the role of the folks that do drug and alcohol abuse prevention work or substance misuse work on college campuses. I know our data in Missouri, and I'm assuming it's on in every campus, um, is going to be important to look at and know that substances have a role in almost every major well-being concern among college students. And so, therefore, it's important for our campus leadership to know the professional nature of this work. Our state agencies and our offices, um, our national organizations, those who plan training, um, plan the support for our colleges and universities and their staff, I think are critical key partners in using this resource as they move forward. I think that you know it's very important to to note here that um, and this is a quote from the app, from the document to pass along is that the professional development of our campus prevention specialist is significant. This shouldn't be something that's taken lightly. Again, the professionalism of our work. We've always been professionals, but are we always seen that way in the context of our campuses? And that our campus leaders should seek to, if they really seek to achieve those desired outcomes of health, safety, and overall success and well being for our college campuses, then they need to have desired outcomes for the people that are responsible for guiding those outcomes on college campuses with students. And those are the folks like yourselves and us who are, who are doing that work every day on campus. So Joan's going to talk a little bit about a, a specific training opportunity. I'll, I'll just note that, again, this was done in tandem or done um, independently, but with some cross-fertilization. One did not precede the other. 
Uh, but th there's some other training opportunities that are in the works having to do specifically with these competencies. No details yet, because we don't have them. We'll share them. We'll share them with uh, Anthony Logan and uh, the others at the Higher Education Center once we have them. But Joan wants to talk about something, a specific application that has been done and is available. As I mentioned earlier, um, there was a, a six part course that was designed with the Prevention Technology Transfer Center in Great Lakes. Um, and it was uh, piloted as the fundamentals of substance misuse prevention in higher education. Um, I, at that point, had at the development of the course had gotten a sneak peek at the competencies David was putting together. Um, it was the oh. list of competencies at that point. And at that point, they were identified as foundational or more advanced in nature. And so look at while that foundational nature, et cetera, has been taken out of the competencies um, in our final document, um, it still informed the training that was created to, um, to provide some foundational level information built on implementing the strategic for prevention framework. So we developed this course uh, and piloted it in um, the in Great Lakes along with some other colleagues uh, because current trainings like the um, trainings that were available on the SPIF um, and the SAPS training failed to address the unique complexities of implementing evidence-based prevention in higher education. And what we know is that prevention professionals in higher education come from a variety of places. They come from fraternity and sorority life. They might come from doing harm reduction work in the community. They might um, come straight out of graduate school in an overall um, very general student affairs preparation program where this information is not shared. And so it's important to create that level of sort of leveling the playing field so that folks are implementing evidence-based strategies and knowing what um, planning models are out there to be able to use. There is no current certification or academic program specifically teaching higher education prevention science. And so in order to shore that up, um, this certainly is not meant to uh, replace an academic program, but rather um, cure up some of the, um, the holes that might be missing in folks' preparation before they take these roles. So therefore, um, the training program was created to, cre to really address those base level competencies for those working in substance misuse in higher education. As we see um, on this slide, these are the learning objectives for the course. Um, we are sharing this with you because we are getting ready to do two things in 2023, to continue to provide these trainings um, as folks need them and register for them. But most importantly, have myself and my co-trainer, Kathleen Radcliffe um, from Indiana, not be the only two people in the world that can train, but rather do a train the trainer um, for my colleagues who work as statewide coalition coordinators, for folks who are faculty and want to in, um, put this in their course, for prevention professionals that simply want this as a background. Um, so especially for my colleagues and friends that have been in the, in the their roles or in this work for more than five years, we would love to have you join us for a train the trainer so that you can continue to use this resource. The resource has been built. It's in the public domain. It's free to use. Um, but we, it, through a train the trainer course, then can give you the resources such as the speaker notes and the facilitator guide, et cetera, to be able to offer this to your communities to give folks that base level of foundational competence as a substance abuse prevention professional, so that then you can build um, on the other competencies in the, the guide that David's describing. We had um, in the course timeline, I get questions like, well, what does it cover? Um, it is built, built on a case study model, which walks people through um, how to use um, the strategic prevention framework at each level of the strategic prevention framework using a campus level case study. Um, in addition, it talks, it gives a um, foundational level information about um, the complexities of higher education, some epidemiology about college student substance abuse behavior, and um, how you implement the public health approach use it or to address substance misuse prevention in higher education and some of the really key resources that are necessary to have in your back pocket like um, the um, the college aim uh, using the resources from the DEA and um, the SPIF training resources that are available through um, campus drug prevention etc so 
that is overall what the course looks like. My contact information will be up at the end of this discussion, and we'd love to have you um, if you're interested in it all. Unfortunately, I don't have any registration to provide at this point, but if you send me an email, I'll add you to any of our folks that are interested in either being a trainer or just attending the course in general. Thank you, Joan. And now, you know, we've, we've been flying again with a 72 page document. You can download it. You can read it. We hope that we've brought this to life so that you see what it is. First of all, why we built it, then what it is again, Joan, with that training, the three part uh, tra training module. Um, is a way of applying again foundational but in terms of discussion here we're interested in your take and whether you put them in the chat probably the best thing to do is put them in put any comments in the chat and logan will be monitoring that and share any questions that you may have for us or or just comments you know overall reactions suggestions about the key audiences we identified seven key audiences joan highlighted those and again there's a paragraph or two about each of those seven in the professional competencies guide what suggestions do you have about how various audiences might use the resource so it's not just you but it could be other audiences it could be at the campus level it could be at the state level what might enhance the resources value and power and relevance and impact and what ways might you or your campus use the resource so just any comments or questions that you may have we have another 15 minutes uh, before we turn everything back over uh, to anthony and logan uh, for closing comments but we wanted to make sure we had a good chunk of time for you to engage with anything you have to say. So Logan, if you're monitoring the questions or the chat, that would I be- I am. Thank you, Dr. Anderson and Joan. Joan, quick question for you on the course. Should people attend or like go through the course before um, going through the train the trainer? I think it would be, um... It definitely a good idea to do so. We do have, and some of them actually, I think are participants on this call of the 35 or so people that attended the pilot, we'll be targeting them for um, probably the first train the trainer course, if they're interested in sharing this with their communities. Um, but our hope is that we'll offer enough um, courses over time, probably via Zoom over a couple of weeks that then folks can then feel comfortable enough to attend the train the trainer course to be able to use the resource. Absolutely, thank you, Joan. Um, and this is to both of you about the appropriateness of the competencies being used uh, with student leaders, kind of peer educators. And what are your thoughts about how that might work? I, Go ahead. I, I can answer that just as a, like a former peer educator turned preventionist a long time ago. Um, I do think that where the I think the role that paraprofessionals and young young um, entering professionals play in this is to share this with rising peer educators that are interested in going into public health, that are interested in sitting for the chess, maybe as undergraduate students or other ways in which they're thinking about maybe doing this work and um, helping them select graduate programs that maybe will assist them in gaining these skills. Potentially by the time that, that this is rolling and just in that perfect world, there maybe is graduate programs that are offering courses on doing public health work specifically among college and university public um, populations. And so um, I don't know that it's necessarily a, a guide that I would have students come through and have them feel like they have to ma have all the mastery to be peer educators in any certain way. But I think it's meant as a tool or a professional tool to get people excited about entering the profession. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I agree with that. The other thing I would say is and because I am a strong, strong believer in peer education and peer approaches. And actually, I've done that at the college level and also at the opposite extreme with uh, elders, you know, people 80 and above. I am not in that category. 
but uh, working training uh, have helped train peer peer helpers we called them in our in a community i was in in, uh, in northern virginia and, uh, with the vietnamese actually uh, but but in terms of the peer outreach what i would suggest is having the professional look at a lot of these you know joan was talking about kind of like a pathway into higher education into uh, into graduate programs whether it's in public health or student affairs or whatever uh, but also have the professionals on the campus take a look at a lot of these competencies and you might adapt some of them for the peer educator uh, we, we wrote this for the professional not just the full-time aod coordinator but also as they're working with others on campus who might be partners maybe you have an anthropology professor or a marketing professor and they're going to contribute or have a course buyout X percent of their time, but you want to make sure that they're consistent with your messaging. So that, that's one frame I would offer. I'd offer something different that's, that's a different kind of spin off on this. I shared this guide a week ago with a former US Department of Health and Human Services official, now retired, a top official there, who said, I love this. I love this. This is so important for the work in, in in this area and at the same time not just for drugs and alcohol as joan highlighted and our advisory group said the higher ed setting is different from other settings and the drug and alcohol issue is different from other issues so there's those two uniquenesses that feed into this but if you look at communications there's a lot we can learn from outside aod and higher education about communications there's a lot we can learn about leadership so there's applications with some of this framework outside of what we intended. We wrote this for higher education and for drugs and alcohol specifically. So just thinking a little more broadly, taking liberties with the question about the peers, but thinking about other, other topics, if you will, with which one might adapt this. Because um, it, has, it has a lot of power, building competencies has a lot of power and, and it's vitally important. We, we, you know, we, we mentioned in the guide, we see competencies valued with all sorts of professions. If you go back in time and look at what the campus health services looked like 50 years ago, it's not like what it looks like today. Look at campus security. It was not camp, <laughs> it was often not campus police. Um, so, so just look at these other areas that have built those competencies and value that and we think it's time that a lot of the prevention professionals in, in drug and alcohol abuse prevention um, is valued externally. We value it, but it's valued externally. If I, if I could just add one thing that, I, again, it's not necessarily related to the question at hand, but it, it raised something for me in my mind as David was talking, is that um, early, early in my career was when the, the, the foundations of the first NIAAA um, work was being done, and then College AIM was released uh, about seven or eight years later. And both publications really did help me in my career as folks would come to me maybe that weren't as uh, familiar with evidence-based strategies and say, I have a really great idea. We're going to have a docudrama on campus and we're going to scare people. And I would say, I cannot do that because the, the um, one, it doesn't work. And let me show you these documents. But I think this is another place that then when we have professionals that come to us and want to partner with us and want to do things that we know are going to um, not be in line with our professional values of the things that truly do make change and our evidence-based strategies, we can say, there are professional competencies in my profession. Again, this is a professional role that I have on campus and I can't engage in behavior. It's, all, it's very similar to those of us who, I have a prevention certification I have a, a code of ethics I have to you know, lean on. And so when I've had folks come to me and say, We're, we don't want you to talk about that thing, I'll say, well, then I'm not going to come and talk at all because my professional ethics dictate the fact that I have to tell the truth when it comes to data. I have to be um, forthcoming when it comes to the work that we do. And so this is just that, that, that set of groundwork that helps folks have a, a professional sense of what they do, even if they have to, if that means that they're using it in their sales pitch to others about how important their work is on campus. 
Any other comments or questions, Logan? Yeah, absolutely. Question coming in about kind of intersection with other fields. Um, this one specifically asked about social work um, and could it be recognized or championed by NASW? But I think broadly is how does it interact with other professional associations, especially those within the higher education um, kind of realm? Well, I think there's two different strands there. Let, let me take the, 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 that last piece that you said. Um, this fir the first presentation we did, and so this is the second real public presentation on this. We did a, a briefing at the coalition meeting with the Higher Ed Center a few weeks ago. But um, I worked with COHESAP. So there's like 20 college associations which are part of this Coalition of Higher Education Associations for Substance Abuse Prevention, COHESAP, C-O-H-E-S-A-P.org. -E it's one of the resources in our document. Uh, so I uh, went to Pittsburgh and and um, met with them and talked with them about what this document was. That's the first time it got released in, in mid-October. And so those associations, whether it's a Kuho I or the Association of Fraternity Advisors or ACPA and ACUI and um, ACHA, all, all of the traditional college groups that have interest and commitment to substance misuse prevention are part of COHESAP, NCAA. Uh, so, so they're looking at that about what ways that they can be helpful in helping promote this and promote these competencies. The, the earlier part of your question, I think, has to do with those who may not be at the table with COHESAP. You know, you're talking about social workers, social work association. Um, and so definitely there can be applications with, with those. I, I think what we would hope is those who are on this call, those who listen to this webinar later, those who read a press release, think about the associations you're part of. I'm part of some other associations that have nothing to do with higher education. American Society of Public Administration, doesn't that sound exciting? And so I can do an outreach and an article to those journals, and hopefully that can filter into some other research initiatives. Maybe they wanna do something at a, at a conference that highlights higher education and substance misuse prevention. So I think, I think it's gonna take individual action wherever you're affiliated to say, I think, this, I'm a member of this association of social workers or of cultural anthropologists or whatever your group is. If you see there's a fit, advocate for it. I, I don't. I, I don't think there's a magic answer, but I think, you know, it, it, as, as the College Alcohol Survey, as I documented in one of the early slides, alcohol is a big part of our college. Alcohol misuse is a big part of our college life, and 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 so that's not just for us to deal with it. It's a big part of our societal life. And, and so many of these groups, schools of business, you know, here is gonna be business leaders who are gonna manage employees and, and do training. Can, can they embed it and, and develop skills? I mean, it's not just in a business setting, not just having an employee assistance program. It's much more, what can you do proactively? All of this is proactive because our philosophy is for college, health enhancing environment. And then the belief of all of us sitting around the table building this was prevention. It's These issues are preventable. I'll, I will um, give my answer sort of in relation to, I know Rich has put a question in the chat about um, what advice do you have for folks who are looking at the breadth and depth of all of this and like really see it as daunting? How can you make it manageable? I think that for me, an answer to that question um, previously is that, again, both of the resources, the training that I put together and this group of professional competencies that David and the committee has, our, the advisory group has put together um, can be used in whatever way right now you find most helpful. So I could see myself to, yes, of course, I, if, if I just sit down in front of it and say, I'm going to get to make a to-do list of getting all these skills, that's not what it's meant to do. But if, for instance, um, I have a fantastic group of young professionals um, that work for me in Missouri Partners in Prevention, 
most who are already have a foundational knowledge of what they do. But if someone new was starting to my staff, I might identify a few of the professional competencies and have them identify training for themselves or upon going to NASPA strategies in a few months, identify a few of the sessions that they're going to and what competencies they um, are addressing by going to those sessions. So again, it's not meant to be an exhaust, exhaustive list where you either get a 0% or 100%. It's meant to fill a gap, which has been zero <laughs> of nothing, um, to give you um, ways to work with, um, to be able to say how what we do makes a difference um, and why we need to understand it from a professional level um, and how we implement it in a professional way and how all of our training and our knowledge and our experience connects with each other. Dr. Anderson, we probably only have about two minutes for questions, but I wanna yep. throw that question from Rich to you, kind of Joan already touched on a little bit, is what advice do you have for folks who are looking at the breadth and depth of the skills and knowledge associated with each competency as daunting? And we only have about two minutes. It is daunting and make it in bite-sized pieces. Side example, and I won't cite the person. Uh, when Tom Hall and I did our book, Leading Campus, this is about how do you lead in campus drug and alcohol misuse prevention. I know of one state that is doing this as a, what do you call it, a book club. So it's a chapter a month. I also know of a professional who reads a page or two a day, kind of like as inspirational, as inspiring, or as ground is to keep grounded. So the point is to answer Rich's question, bite-sized pieces. And the other thing I would offer, and this was, I had the honor of, of uh, being interviewed by Rich uh, recently in a podcast uh, with his Take Five series, is, is something I would close out this session with is it's a sense of hope. Just because the ladder is so high or the, the reach is so high, we can get there, but it's one step at a time. I mean, we talk about self-help, uh, mutual aid, so forth. Um, one day at a time, one step at a time. Bite-sized pieces. Look, look at what you can manage. Look at where you can partner. Think strategically. Just keep it in perspective. You can't know it all. The more any of us know, the more we realize we don't know. Uh, but this is meant to be um, what we think is the eight core competencies and helping to move all of us forward and to make our lives a lot easier, ultimately. That's the aim. And I have that hope that we can do this and that this can be moved. Hope that's within two minutes. Yeah, that that is perfect. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. And Anthony's going to pull up our closing slides just rem remind some folks of a couple things. And Dr. Anderson, I think it, just, it reminds us kind of that one bite at a time um, philosophy. Um, and I think digesting this, we don't have to know everything about the competencies by the end of the week um, or even by the end of the year. It's making time to make us a, a little bit better in our commitment and our hope for the profession. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, Joan and, and Dr. Anderson, thank you both very much. Just want to remind people of events coming up. We have our Cannabis Symposium December 1st. Um, and if you're like me and lost track of time, December is unfortunately not far away. Um, and so that, that is coming up in just a couple of weeks. Um, and so please register for that. Learn more at our website, hecaod.osu.edu. And we have a water cooler chat coming up on December the 13th. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their day um, to join us. And just thank you for the work that you do for our profession um, and just for being able to connect with us at the Higher Education Center. And one last thanks um, for Joan and Dr. Anderson for giving of yourselves and your time and your talent. Um, and thanks for everything that you're doing um, to help move the profession forward. Hope everyone has a wonderful day and take care. Thank you, Logan. Thank you, Anthony.